Okay, today I would like to speak to you about some recent work in my group assessing the nature of the X-ray emission from typical radio loud quasars. And I'll be trying to assess uh, whether the jets or the coronae of these systems are primarily responsible for the, their X-ray emission. Uh, the work today will be uh, focused on the energetically dominant small scale nuclear emission of radio loud quasars. I will not be speaking about the extended and resolved X ray jets, which typically only make a small fraction of the total X ray power co coming out of one of these systems. Uh, moreover, um, from the title, you can see we're aiming to discuss the typical uh, objects of the population, the objects making the majority of the population. Um, we certainly appreciate that there will be exceptional outlier objects that will deviate from some of the things that we're saying here, and I'll comment on those. Uh, the work has been led by an excellent Penn State graduate student, Shifu Zhu, uh, shown here. And there have also been uh, substantial contributions from, from myself and from uh, John Timlin, who is an excellent uh, Penn State uh, postdoctoral uh, researcher, as well as our other uh, helpful collaborators. So it has been known since the 1980s that radio loud quasars show excess X-ray emission compared to matched radio quiet quasars. And the, the amount of excess X-ray emission is large. It's around a factor of three on average. There, there's a range from object to object, but it's on average large. So that this, X, this um, excess X-ray emission generally dominates the X-ray power output from uh, these systems. And uh, since the uh, 1980s, the, the standard picture has been that this, um, this nuclear excess X-ray emission is uh, largely arising from their jets. So the jets uh, shown here in this diagram are thought to be producing uh, this X-ray emission. Uh, people typically invoke uh, non-thermal synchrotron self-Compton emission or um, inverse Compton emission uh, being responsible for uh, producing uh, this, this uh, radiation. The, this standard picture has been very sensibly uh, based on studies of luminosity correlations as well as X-ray uh, spectral studies, but uh, the early data were in fact fairly limited People were doing the best they could with the data they had in their hands. Um, but uh, based on better data that I'll be discussing, we, we believe that in fact, uh, the early data were, were fairly limited and in fact probably had significant biases in it that led to some of the conclusions. Um, so based on extensive analyses of new high quality samples, uh, we are arguing that the nuclear X-ray emission from most radio loud quasars, not all, but most radio loud quasars is in fact arising from the corona, the same basic structure that, that produces the X-ray emission in radio quiet quasars and radio quiet safer galaxies, this accretion disk coronal structure shown down here in, in this diagram. And the emission process then would still be a thermal Comptonization, just as it is for the, the, the radio quiet objects, again, arising uh, in the corona. Uh, and then, as I've said, there, there are going to be exceptions to this overall picture. Um, these are typically for the rare, highly radioluminous, flat spectrum radio loud quasars, the, the blazars, and so on. Clearly, many of those systems are, are jet dominated in the X ray. But again, we're focusing on the typical systems uh, in this talk. And so, what I'll do now is give some highlights of our, our work. So, first, I'll start with a brief description of the sample. Um, that, that's utilized for this work. We put a lot of effort into generating a high quality sample that would allow us to derive reliable conclusions. And we work with radio loud quasars, RLQs, uh, drawn from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data release 14 uh, quasar catalog, which was generated over about 9,376 square degrees. So a large fraction of the sky these are optically selected uh, radio loud quasars. We then have carefully um, found the radio loud objects uh, in this large uh, sample uh, by visually inspecting the first and NVSS data to match up the radio data to, to the optical quasar. That's very important to be sure that emission from lobes, for example, is not missed uh, 
uh, which can occur with just simple matching uh, analyses. And we then <coughs> select <coughs> the objects that have sensitive Chandra or XMM Newton coverage. This results in 729 well-characterized radio loud quasars. These are these objects mostly have serendipitous X-ray coverage, which minimizes uh, biases that can arise when you uh, have a sample that's primarily made of targeted objects, uh, many of which may have been targeted for various obscure reasons uh, that, that would make them non-representative of, of the population as a whole. So we have mostly serendipitous X-ray coverage. And in fact, we can generate entirely uh, serendipitous samples uh, as well, and we have, and we utilize those in many of the analyses, that that removes any possibility of biases, because these are pure serendipitous samples. Um, <clears throat> the, the majority, 90.1% of these sources are X-ray detected, owing to the sensitive Chandra and XMM Newton coverage that, that's being utilized. That's a big improvement compared to many past studies. Um, and a large fraction, around 97%, have radio slope measurements for example, coming from the, the VLASS. So we can determine if these objects are steep spectrum radio loud quasars or flat spectrum radio loud quasars for the vast majority of the sample. And again, that's a big improvement compared to many uh, past analyses. And it's uh, very valuable um, as we'll see when trying to interpret the results because we'll often be splitting things up into steep spectrum radio loud quasars and flat spectrum radio loud quasars. Uh, we also have <clears throat> quality multi-wavelength spectral energy distributions for these quasars uh, generated from the radio data, from uh, WISE, from VISTA, from UKIDS, from SDSS, and then from the, from the X-ray data. And of course, we have Sloan Digital Sky Survey spectra uh, available that let us characterize the strong broad lines uh, that are present in these optically selected uh, radio loud quasars. And then we will use appropriate subsets of these 729 radio loud quasars for the various studies uh, that I'll be describing now. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to, to read all the details of the sample selection because we put a lot of work into this sample and it was a huge data trawl effort to pull all this uh, together. <clears throat> okay, so there, there are three basic things I would like to speak about now. First, I would like to talk about uh, luminosity correlations between, for example, the X-ray luminosity, the ultraviolet luminosity, and the radio luminosity which again is telling you about the small scale X-ray emission, about perhaps the, the accretion disk and the ultraviolet. <clears throat> and then um, the radio, of course, is telling you about the jets. And, and the work I'll focus on here is, is described in this substantive paper uh, led by Shifu Zhu. Um, and I encourage you to check out this paper if you want to see more of, of the details. So I'll just hit some of the highlights here. So. As I said, we, we are looking at uh, luminosity correlations in this paper, because uh, this again was one of the ways that the initial um, picture uh, for the, the jet nature of the X-ray emission was originally um, you know, built. And so we are gonna look at those same correlations now with improved data and, and see what, what we can learn relative to the earlier, uh, more limited data. And so <clears throat> to begin with, I, I will note that radio quiet quasars have long been known uh, to follow a correlation between the X-ray coronal luminosity shown along the y-axis here and the optical disk luminosity. And, and this is the, the well-known correlation between X-ray and optical or optical UV luminosity um, <clears throat> shown here, where essentially the X-ray luminosity scales of the ultra lumin ultraviolet luminosity to about the 0.63 power. And this is the relation um, taken from other work, because we don't do the radio quiet quasar analyses here, this is the correlation taken from other work, just plotted. Um, the notable thing that we find when looking at the steep spectrum radio loud quasars, which is what I show in the, the top panel, is that the steep spectrum radio loud quasars follow almost the same correlation quantitatively as the radio quiet quasars do. And you can see that here. Here is the power law relation from our best fit for the steep spectrum radio loud quasars. And to within fairly small uncertainties, they follow almost the same correlation in terms of slope, although the correlation is clearly offset in to, to higher normalization for the steep spectrum radio loud quasars. And that indicates or at least suggests that the steep spectrum radio loud quasars may have coronal x-rays just as the radio quiet quasars do because they're following the same slope relation. <clears throat> 
Okay, now that's not proof of anything, but it's suggestive, and I'll show you more evidence momentarily. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the flat spectrum radio loud quasars uh, shown in this bottom panel, they show a somewhat steeper correlation, okay, than do the radio quiet quasars, indicating that at least for some of the flat spectrum radio loud quasars, there, there may well be some jet contributions to the X-ray emission, which is causing the relation to deviate in slope compared to what was known for the, the radio quiet quasar. So at least in some of these cases, there may, may well be um, jet contributions running around. <clears throat> okay, so we have now then broken up these relations uh, as a function of radio loudness. And, and that's what's shown in the top panel for, again, the steep spectrum radio loud quasars in the bottom panel for the flat spectrum radio loud quasars. And, and notably, we find that the normalization for the steep spectrum radio loud quasars increases smoothly with the radio loudness, which is shown as the, the color bar here, um, while always retaining to the best of our ability to measure it, we can measure it pretty well, um, while always retaining the radio quiet quasar relation slope. And you can see that here. So here's radio quiet quasars, here's low radio uh, loudness, steep spectrum objects, here's medium, um, radio loudness here is high radio loudness objects. And so it appears, um, for, at least for the steep spectrum objects, that there is a radio quiet quasar like coronal emission following the same quantitative relation as for the radio quiet quasars, but with a jet linked X ray volume control that sets the normalization uh, of the relation. That is, there would be a corona jet connection here, as is often discussed for uh, black hole X ray binaries, uh, for example. Um, in, um, in the bottom panel, then I show the flat spectrum radio loud quasars, and the flat spectrum radio loud quasars progressively depart from the, the, relation, from the slope relation for radio quiet quasars. Um, as the radio loudness increases. So you can see for, for low radio loudness objects, they still are pretty similar in slope to the radio quiets. But then as you go to higher and higher radio loudnesses, they progressively get steeper and steeper, deviating from the relation for the radio quiet objects. And this is broadly what you might expect as you dial up the radio loudness, uh, an increasing jet contribution is coming into play, and, and that is causing the slope of the relation to deviate. So you get a kind of consistent physical picture from uh, looking at things this way. Now, to assess these matters more thoroughly and more carefully than just making characteristic diagrams like these, we have done <clears throat> proper statistical model selection um, using statistical techniques, uh, aiming to compare critically the different possible interpretations, the coronal uh, interpretation versus the, the jet uh, interpretation for the X-ray emission. Uh, to do this, we utilize the Akaiki and Bayesian information criteria to assess which possible models statistically describe the data the best. And we find that the data generally prefer the coronal scenario with a corona jet connection, exactly like we had inferred from these basic diagrams I'm showing you here, um, at least for the steep spectrum radio loud quasars and for the, for the radio loud quasar population in general, the data generally prefer the coronal scenario according to these two information criteria. Um, a distinct jet x-ray component is likely important for a, for a small frac portion or a small fraction of the flat spectrum radio loud quasars as well, although the majority of those still seem to be pro probably uh, coronal dominated to the best of our ability to assess things with actual proper statistical model selection. This statistical model uh, selection analysis is a long and involved one. I won't go through all the details here. I will refer you to this paper by Zhu et al, which lays out all the models being tested, how the information criteria are being used, how the um, uh, various models are being selected as favored or not favored. Please refer to this paper for all the details because they are very involved. Um, what I then will say is, is the overall picture emerging from our luminosity correlations work is, is the following. Um, the overall picture is that the coronae of radio loud quasars become X-ray brighter with increasing jet power. So for radio quiet systems uh, shown here, the corona has its kind of nominal strength, well known for, for radio quiet systems. But then as you go to increasingly radio loud objects, to moderately radio loud or highly radio loud objects, the corona becomes increasingly strongly X-ray emitting 
And as the jet gets dialed up, which we associate with the radio loudness going up, at least a first approximation, um, the X-ray emission from the coronal structure goes correspondingly up and up and up. That is the corona jet connection that I was alluding to uh, previously. That's the basic picture emerging from the luminosity correlation studies. Now, uh, to investigate this matter further, we have utilized X-ray spectra and X-ray variability information uh, for these objects. And this is in a recently um, completed paper that has appeared on archive just this, this month, again, led by Shifu Zhu and, and John Timlin, and I was heavily involved as well. And, and this paper, again, investigates the X-ray spectral and variability properties of typical radio loud quasar. So here we take a, a subset of those 729 objects I had uh, described previously, and we do careful X-ray spectral and variability analyses of them. And <clears throat> the first thing we do is we look at the basic power law continuum X-ray emission, and we compare the X-ray emission from 339 radio loud quasars um, and a matched sample of radio quiet quasars, matched in luminosity and matched in redshift. So we have a, a carefully matched sample. We have a huge sample of radio quiet quasars, which we have analyzed in the X-ray in a self-consistent manner. And so you can compare the two samples um, carefully uh, with a consistent analysis for, for both. And what we find uh, when we um, plot the, the power law photon index versus the signal to noise ratio is first of all, we see no dependence on signal to noise ratio. And the median um, power law photon index is, is well constrained. Uh, the median for the radio loud quasars is about 1.84. And the median for the radio quiet quasars is about 1.9. And you can see that these two, given the error bars, are different, but not very different. Um, they're, they're close to one another. The median gamma of the radio loud quasars is close to that of the matched radio quiet quasars. It certainly, for the radio loud quasars, our analysis finds a steeper overall median power law photon index than has been found for past radio loud quasars that had X-ray spectra. There have been many papers going back again to the 1980s that have been analyzing the X-ray spectra of various uh, small samples of, of radio loud quasars. We have a much larger sample here with, again, the various uh, advantages of the sample selection that, that we built in from the start. <clears throat> and <clears throat> compared to uh, the previous work, um, we, we think our sample has significant advantages. Uh, we believe the past samples were, were again, small and were heterogeneous having objects selected in a wide variety of ways, many of which were targeted objects, which may have been targeted for peculiar reasons. <clears throat> and we uh, also know that many of the past samples likely had an overrepresentation of radio selected flat spectrum radio loud quasars, which are gonna be the objects that are preferentially highly beamed. These are rare objects, not representative of the overall population, but they're overrepresented in the available X-ray samples because these objects are interesting for other reasons that are frequently targeted. Um, we have also looked for correlations of this X-ray power law photon index with uh, radio loudness and with the X-ray luminosity in excess of that expected from a radio quiet quasar, and we don't find any correlations there either. Um, which is notable. And if, again, you had a jet-linked X-ray component coming in, you might expect that as the radio loudness went up or as the contribution over that expected from a radio quiet quasar went up, you, you might expect the power law photon index to start to deviate from that of low radio loudness systems or low X-ray luminosity systems, and that is not observed. So that is also suggestive of the fact that you probably don't have this additional jet component coming into play, perturbing things away from, from the corona. Um, <clears throat> another piece of evidence uh, that we can put forward comes from our investigation of X-ray reflection features. Uh, these we cannot analyze for individual objects in general, but what we can do is we can stack this large sample. Um, we've stacked a, a carefully selected subset of 216 radio loud quasars. And the idea here, of course, is that if the X-ray emission is indeed largely from jets, then reflection signatures, reflection features should be weak because you can't beam these features and, and they will be diluted by the beamed jet X-ray emission. And so when we look at our <coughs> stacked radio loud quasar spectra, 
um, we see, for example, iron K alpha emission shown here over a fairly broad range of energy, but there's clearly is iron K alpha emission there. And when you add up the typical equivalent width, it's fairly large. It's about 190 electron volts. <clears throat> and when we analyze the X-ray spectra for the radio loud objects and the matched radio quiet objects, and we compare them versus one another, the equivalent widths for the radio loud objects and the radio quiet, radio quiet objects are actually statistically consistent uh, with each other. And of course, you can consider here the X-ray Baldwin effect and so on as well. But the point is that you see this, these strong reflection features. Um, you don't expect these from, from a beamed system, uh, whereas you do expect them if the X-ray emission is predominantly coronal. And this supports what we've been saying from all the other um, results, that this is probably coronal dominated emission. Uh, we also find suggestive evidence for the Compton reflection hump in our stack spectra, particularly for the higher redshift object where we can access the Compton reflection hump effectively. And, and so that is additional um, consistent uh, evidence along with the iron K alpha emission that the extra reflection features are strong uh, in these systems. And again, all of this is as expected for a coronal origin of the X-rays and not expected for a jet dominated origin of the X-rays. Um, we have also <coughs> performed a, a long-term X-ray variability analysis for 105 radio loud quasars. Um, 105 of our radio loud quasars have two or more Chandra or XMM Newton observations. Uh, and so we can analyze these to look at X-ray variability, typically over long time scales, from time scales of about a month out to about 10 years. And this table down here shows previous investigations of the long-term X-ray variability of radio loud quasars. And in fact, the statistical uh, analysis of radio loud quasar X-ray variability is in fact quite limited. Um, our paper, again, we have 105 objects with 297 objects, observations in total, and they forming 314 pairs with a typical time scale of 1.7 years. And if you look at the previous uh, available analyses, they had much smaller samples by an order of magnitude or more. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> of course, there also are these very interesting uh, detailed uh, X-ray variability studies of individual objects, individual radio loud systems. Um, of course, these are very exciting for you know, probing accretion physics and individual objects, but uh, they don't have the large statistical characterization of the population as a whole, which is what we're aiming for here. So we find that strong blazar-like flares uh, of the X-ray emission are, are fairly rare for the typical radio loud quasars. Um, and this, of course, is also what is known to be the case for most radio quiet quasars. So there's a broad consistency between the X-ray variability of uh, radio loud objects and radio quiet objects. Um, we have also looked at the X-ray variability amplitude. We find that it is, is somewhat smaller for the radio loud quasars than for the mass radio quiet quasars. Uh, and we suggest that this may be due to larger radio loud quasar X-ray emission regions associated with the larger black hole masses that are often suggested for, for, for radio loud quasars. And I will refer you to uh, this 2021 paper if you wanna see all the details of the variability analyses where we've also worked out uh, power uh, density functions as a function of time scale for how the variability changes as a function of time scale. You can see all the, all the details in, in the paper. Um, I want to move on now to the, the third uh, analysis. Uh, this is perhaps probably our most recent one. Uh, this is a paper led by John Timlin um, on the alpha OX helium-2 equivalent with connection in radio loud quasars. And in this paper, we look at this, this relation and we compare this relation for radio loud quasars and for radio quiet quasars. And so we plot here the X-ray to optical flux ratio, alpha OX, versus the helium-2 equivalent width along this axis. Now, why is this an interesting thing to do? Well, it's because the, the helium-2 equivalent width uh, should be an effective tracer of the ultraviolet continuum present in quasars at four plus Rydbergs, because that's what, of course, what makes the helium-2. And what we find is that the radio quiet quasars, the, the, the light blue data points follow this, this relation, which is investigated in detail in another paper by, by John Timlin. Um, and when you overplot the steep spectrum radio loud quasars and the low radio luminosity flat spectrum radio loud quasars, they appear to be broadly consistent 
with the same relation that is followed for the radio quiet quasars. Now, now, why is that interesting? Well, that's interesting because it's telling you that for most radio loud quasars, when the X-rays are brighter, the unbeamed extreme ultraviolet responsible for making the helium-2 emission is correspondingly brighter by the same factor, or at least by a quantitatively similar factor. And of course, this is not really expected for beamed jet X-rays. There's no reason why the beamed jet X-rays should correlate with the unbeamed EUV in a closely quantitative manner. It's not impossible that could be the case, but it would be somewhat surprising. Whereas we know that for radio quiet quasars, again, from other work by John Timlin, those two things are rather well correlated. And so the fact that these two, the, these sets of objects follow the ver a very similar relation supports the idea that, again, this is predominantly coronal emission. Now, again, interestingly, if you look at high radio luminosity, flash spectrum radio loud quasars, they deviate from the relation. They very clearly deviate. You can see the black data points here are clearly all above the relation indicating that when the X-rays go up, the helium-2 does not go up correspondingly, okay? And this is what you would expect if you had jet X-rays present in the highly radioluminous flat spectrum radio loud quasar. So for those objects, they're very likely, it are jet X-rays contributing substantially to the X-ray luminosity. Whereas for the other objects, we see little to no evidence that there is um, jet X-ray emission contributing at a substantial level at least, and, and that probably the X-ray emission is coronal in nature for all the reasons I've, I've gone through. Okay, so I'd like to then end by talking about a few additional implications of our results. Um, I'd like to start by commenting on the unification of quasars and black hole X-ray binaries. Our, our uh, analyses actually improve the, the parallel between quasars and black hole X-ray binaries. These two different types of systems are known to have many parallels with, with one another, but there was this puzzling uh, fact previously where, uh, where the quasars were proposed to have jet-dominated X-ray emission, whereas the black hole X-ray binaries have long been argued to have generally corona-dominated X-ray emission, even when they're launching jets. And so they were puzzlingly non-parallel uh, in this respect, uh, prior to our work, and our work is arguing that just like the black hole X-ray binaries, the quasars also have coronal dominated X-ray emission uh, in most cases. And so that improves the parallelism between these two sets of objects. Uh, furthermore, uh, our analyses allow identification of the alpha OX LUV relation for radio quiet quasars as the quasar jet line in the hardness intensity diagram. So we can make uh, an analog of the hardness intensity diagram for, for quasars. Um, and of course, this, this diagram has been shown to be very effective in understanding the physical processes operating in black hole X-ray binaries. And here, in fact, is uh, the, the, the diagram. So for the intensity part of the intensity hard, or hardness intensity diagram, we use the 2,500 angstrom luminosity. And then for the hardness, well, here, of course, you're, you're sampling a different part of the SED in um, stellar mass systems and supermassive black hole systems. So we use the alpha OX parameter for the hardness parameter. Now, people have made similar plots uh, to this in the past. So this type of a plot isn't entirely new. Uh, what is new uh, in terms of what we've found is that, again, we, are, we have now argued that this, at least the speed spectrum radio loud quasar, which is what we focus on here, um, predominantly have coronal X-ray emission, not jet-dominated X-ray emission, which was the standard picture previously. And so the same basic emission process is making the X-ray emission from these objects and from the radio quiet objects. And so you can actually compare them in, in a consistent way in, in diagrams like this. And as I had mentioned, you find when you look at the steep spectrum radio loud quasars um, that they have a relation that is rather similar in terms of its slope to the, the alpha OX L2500 diagram for radio quiet quasars just shifted in normalization. And if, you, if we color code our objects by radio loudness, you can see the most radio loud objects are over here. You go to somewhat less radio loud objects here, somewhat less radio loud objects here, and then radio quiet quasars here. And then we have a good sampling of carefully uh, studied uh, radio quiet quasars uh, from this work by Leor and, and Behar, which we utilize. And you can see that there is this nice parallelism, again, between the steep factor radio loud quasars, the radio quiet objects, 
And we are proposing that the alpha OX LUV relation known for many years can also be interpreted as practically the jet line for quasars. That is the relation or near to it where quasars you know, be, settle down when they are not producing jets. And then when they start producing jets, they migrate over to this part of the diagram. Okay, this is again, has a lot of parallels with uh, what is uh, studied for black hole X-ray binaries. <laughs> the third point then is that we argue that black hole spin alone probably does not control quasar radio loudness. We suggest that there has to be another factor involved, probably magnetic flux topology, also likely playing a critical role. Um, and th there's a variety of arguments we put forward in the paper. I'll just summarize a couple of them briefly. So to start with, models of jet launching with our work now need to explain the observed corona jet connection uh, that we find. And thus, the role of rapidly spinning black holes can be constrained. Now, at first sight, uh, you, you might think it's plausible that since higher prograde black hole spins will are expected to increase jet production efficiency and will also very likely improve the radiative efficiency of, of the accretion flow, you might broadly expect there to be a radio loudness versus X-ray luminosity relation. And here again, I'm considering the X-ray luminosity from a radio loud object over and above what you might expect from a radio quiet object you might expect there to be a relation of this type um, because both of these things should, again, rise upward uh, for um, as, as you go to higher prograde black hole spins. However, if you look at this issue quantitatively, th there are some problems. Um, to begin with, uh, we note that almost no radio quiet quasars are as X-ray luminous as the most X-ray luminous D-spectrum radio loud quasars. And that's what's shown in this diagram down here. Here we show the X-ray luminosity compared to that of a typical radio quiet quasar versus the cumulative probability for samples of radio quiet quasars, steep spectrum radio quasars in general, and then steep spectrum radio quasars selected to have high radio loudness values. And you can see exactly as you'd expect that the steep spectrum radio loud objects are shifted to higher X-ray luminosities especially for high radio loudness values compared to the radio quiet objects. And the point again, is that there are almost no radio quiet objects that are as comparably X-ray luminous as the most luminous steep spectrum radio loud quasars. This is notable because people who have performed iron K alpha modeling of um, local safer galaxies and other typically radio quiet objects have argued that many radio quiet active galaxies have fast spinning black holes. The point being that again, if indeed, as the um, prograde black hole spin rises, the uh, extra the radio efficiency rises, and you might expect that if you're near to maxing out the spin for radio quiet agents, they should at least be able to match the X-ray luminosities of the steep spectrum radio loud quasar, but they do not. Okay. Also, then, even if, for example, you don't believe that the black hole spins measured with the iron K alpha technique are reliable, and you could have your own opinion on that. Um, and if you somehow just thought that all radio quiet quasars have low spins and the radio loud quasars have high spins, and that is the predominant determining factor of uh, radio loudness in quasars, well, then you might expect there to be a group of X ray underluminous radio loud quasars with high retrograde spins. Uh, the idea there being that um, it has been argued by these people who simulate uh, jet formation that high retrograde black hole spins may also be able to launch jets. And those systems should have lower X-ray luminosities because, the, because for retrograde black hole spins, the efficiency, accretion efficiency goes down. Yet we do not see any radio, steep spectrum radio loud quasars that are, that are X-ray underluminous compared to the radio quiet objects. That just isn't found to be the case observationally. So there's a problem with, with this basic idea as well. So even if you don't believe the iron K alpha spins, you then have to explain why isn't there this group of X-ray underluminous radio loud quasars with high retrograde spins, which are not seen. That's another problem. Um, and, and then finally, I, I will mention that um, another challenge here just goes back to this this um, jet line, a, a singular role of black hole spin is also inconsistent with the jet line, which is well known for black hole X-ray binaries. And we are arguing now is also present for the quasars. 
the point being that as a system, for example, just consider a black hole X-ray binary, as it migrates from being having jets to passing across the jet line and no longer having jets, um, you would have to propose if you think black hole spin is the singular determinant of radio loudness that somehow the black hole spins every time the black hole spin changes substantially every time you go across the jet line, which clearly is not physically plausible. And because we see a parallel behavior now among quasars, you have a similar problem we would argue for the quasars. So that's another issue um, for proposing that the radial volume control is a pure black hole spin driven phenomenon. Um, now, <coughs> then what is, what is controlling the radio loudness if it's not just the black hole spin? Well, many people have argued, and it seems reasonable from the observations that, that we can make as well, that perhaps the magnetic fields in the corona are needed for, for jet launching and that um, something about magnetic flux topology has a critical role in deciding whether a system launches a jet or doesn't. And, and so going back to this picture, which I showed you previously, um, the idea might be that for radio quiet objects, they have a magnetic flux or a magnetic topology that is not able to launch jets, and they also have a more mild corona. Both of these things, the corona and the jets, are thought to be magnetically dominated structures to some extent, and so they might well be linked. So you have weak coronal emission and no jets. Then as you go to uh, some perhaps higher magnetic flux or some change in magnetic topology, you then start to be able to launch jets at a moderate level and the corona becomes more intense in terms of the X-ray emission. And then as you go to highly radio loud object, you have a very powerful jet and a very powerful corona with again, these two structures being linked. So in some sense, the coronal emission, if it's indeed, if indeed you have this uh, jet corona connection can be used as a kind of tracer as to the, the magnetic behavior in addition to the jet. And so again, perhaps the magnetic fields in the corona are needed for the jet launching and our observed corona jet connection that I have described is reflecting changes in magnetic flux and topology. So with that, I will end and uh, thank you for your attention. And if you'd like to see many more details, I will again refer you to those uh, papers by Shifu Zhu and, and John Timlin, which lay out many more of, of the technical arguments and give all of the, the details of the measurements and so on. So thank you very much.